Summer Institute on Geriatrics and Gerontology, which we finally call G&G &G 101. And what would be really nice is to know who we have in the group today. I'm Michelle Saunders. I'm the director of the Swapsea and South Texas Geriatric Education Centers. And uh, our folks with us today, Dr. Susan Statmiller, who is also a colleague on, on our group. Uh, Mark Johnson, who will raise his hand so he doesn't have to interrupt himself, who is our wonderful person on computer and camera, and everyone who doesn't know Bob Merrill, that's Bob Merrill, who's taping the sessions this week. Uh, we hope to be able to make these available later for people who miss them. And Lisa Gonzalez over there, who is our administrator, who most of you have spoken with when you tried to register. and who can answer any odd questions you might have and hopefully meet all of your needs the way she meets all of ours. And uh, to start with, if you'll look in your binder, the first handout, Introduction to Geriatrics and Gerontology, Who Are the Elderly? It's really demographics in aging, basically. And I firmly believe in not pe beating people to death with statistics. And this first talk really is a lot of statistics. And a lot of it is about Texas and how the aging population is growing. And what I really wanted to do uh, today is we've got a new curriculum that we're, we're working on. And it's not completely finished yet. But it's on what healthcare professionals need to know about bioterrorism and emergency preparedness in aging. And I think folks will find that particularly interesting. Uh, because we are living in a different day and age. Um, I was visiting my cousin in Virginia yesterday, and we went by this house, and in front of the house there were these two little kids, and they had their lemonade stand set up. And I said, so how's business? And they said, boring, because they were in front of their house, and it was a very not busy street. And my cousin said, well, why don't, why don't they move around the corner? I said, Poland? This is 2005. I wouldn't let my little kid out of my sight on a busy street. She said, it's not 1955 anymore, is it? And those are the kinds of things we have to be aware of. It's a whole new world. People snatch children. People set off anthrax bombs and so forth. So what we don't do well, actually, is communicate across the health professions and the public sector with regard to aging. There's a tremendous amount coming out of the Centers for Disease Control right now, obviously from Homeland Security. Everything is focusing on pregnant women and children. There's nothing on old people. And that's a real disaster waiting to happen if you think about it. What, what do we have that would render an old person homebound? Any number of catastrophes that could happen, right? Then what happens? if they need medication, if Meals on Wheels isn't coming and that's their only food. If you start to think, it gets really complicated. What we have to do is work very hard at building an infrastructure that's going to meet the needs if, heaven forbid, something should happen. All right. Now we're going to move to bioterrorism and emergency preparedness and aging. And um, I'm just probably going to give a little bit of this. We've been putting this curriculum together um, with a grant. Uh, actually, there are six geriatric education centers around the country. And we have a subcontract from our uh, brother geriatric education center in Houston, uh, the Texas Consortium GEC. And uh, we're, we've been working with the Panhandle and some other folks to sort of get this information out. And obviously, the world has changed since September 11th, and of course, the first anthrax outbreak in October of 2001, and then with SARS in April of 2003. And we do have some important issues because we, as healthcare practitioners, are going to be called upon as first responders to both the 
biographical, the biological challenge, the psychosocial issues of society before, during, and after any sort of terrorist event should it occur. And I think it's important for us to recall that it's not just terrorist events we have to be aware of, but mass disasters as well, whether they're tornadoes, whether they're severe hurricanes, whether they're plane crashes on the ground. Um, there's any number of mass disasters that can occur that we are woefully underprepared for, but we are making progress. It's amazing that these tiny little organisms can wreak such havoc on society. And if you look at the right-handed microbe, the one that's in black and white, that's smallpox. There are hundreds of pathogens out there, viral, bacterial, fungal, or just toxins that are capable of causing illness. And whether they're disseminated in a weaponized form or our mother's nature's worst version, we have to become vigilant. We have to be aware of infection control practices now more than ever. And obviously, we have to be knowledgeable about the biologicals that might be common elsewhere, but prior to global travel, uncommon in the United States. And there are a number of those. Since we had the bioterrorism issues coming out in 01, the Institute of Medicine issued a report on bioterrorism basically saying we weren't ready and we needed to do something about it. We did a, an internet search and we found 314,000 references on bioterrorism recently. And this information came from the Centers for Disease Control. And citations focused almost totally on the six Class A agents identified by CDC. Things like ricin, you know, real toxins and, and anthrax, as well as some of the biologicals. Few of those 314,000 mentioned special needs of frail elders living alone or in long-term care facilities. There are fewer than 50% of our healthcare practitioners who've had any kind of bioterrorism and emergency preparedness training, which makes sense because there are probably that many who've had training in geriatrics and gerontology also. And only one in 10, there you are, even fewer, 10%. It's pretty grim. Healthcare providers, administrators, first responders, and or receivers. First responders are the police, the fire department, the people who get called to the scene to evacuate people or do what needs to be done. Those are your first responders. First receivers are those of us at hospitals and clinics who are going to see these people medically. And emergency department staff all need treatment, uh, excuse me, training and treatment for these, issue, for these um, whole range of illness, organisms, and toxins. But also, there's geroethics in triage. Think about it. You've got a five-year-old, you've got an 80-year-old. They're both in the emergency room. Who's going to get treatment? And if we give treatment to the five-year-old, which I'm sure the 80-year-old would want anyway, are we ever going to get to the 80-year-old? There are a lot of issues here, and we have to make some serious decisions. And to make those decisions, we're going to have to include old people on those decision-making bodies as those things get developed. It's the only way we're going to have it be fair. So you, as a local healthcare professional, in context of everything that's going on around you, notice the FBI's at the top, though I suspect um, that's probably, they've got Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Justice and National Security Council, Department of Defense, and DHHS. And I suspect that Somewhere above FBI is, is the whole Homeland Security piece. This also came from the Centers for Disease Control. And our training has to enable us to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. We can make things worse if we don't know what we're doing. So the kinds of things we need to know is who's vulnerable, what's out there that's new. 
Last week it was ricin, this week it's some um, mustard gas. Um, what kinds of special, bless you, geriatric preparedness issues do we have to be aware of? What do we have to do? What do we have to do now? Now we can do community risk assessments. Look at the CDC website under bioterrorism and emergency preparedness. There is a ton of stuff online, in including community risk assessments, all sorts of training, some of it free, some of it you have to pay for. Communications become imperative throughout the whole range of not only practitioners, but the community resources we have so that we can be a functioning team to deal with these things as quickly as possible. Uh, it, it's boggling to the mind how well our New York Fire Department and police force really did, considering they had not trained for anything like this. I mean, even though we had had a bomb in the World Trade Center, remember that? Several years earlier, nobody ever thought it would happen again. It was small. Nobody foresaw, at least in New York, that kind of catastrophe. And the fact that they had it together with cell phones going down and an inability to really communicate as well as they should have been able to, it's phenomenal. We also need to empower our seniors so that they can help take care of one another and also protect themselves up front, uh, know what to do to prepare and protect themselves. There's a whole section online and also I have about five hours of material and one of them is helping our seniors be prepared about, you know, having a, a tongue blade with important phone numbers and um, everything from doing that to having a list of all their meds, um, just phenomenal kinds of, of things to help people feel not so much victimized. Here are the six uh, Bureau of Health Professions HRSA funded bioterrorism and emergency preparedness and aging projects and we are a subcontract out of Houston as I mentioned. Putting all of this in, in context, older people have altered levels of immune function. So that has an impact if they're confronted with a biological or chemical force. They have an increased risk for infection because of their altered immune function and a reduced response to antibiotics. So if you have an old person who's contracted anthrax, say cutaneous, we won't talk about the lady in Connecticut who died, had the inhalational anthrax. Why did she die nobody else as quickly, though there were other people who, who died from the inhalational anthrax? Because she was old and her immune system couldn't battle it as well, okay? Well, if we have cutaneous anthrax and it's easy enough to give an antibiotic for that, older people will have a harder time battling it because their antibiotic response is decreased. There's an increase in morbidity and mortality that starts happening in all of us as our thymus involutes. It goes away as we age. It puts out all those nice T cells. Chronic illness increases the risk of pneumonia 40 to 150 times. So if someone has diabetes, versus, and they're 70, and here's a set, another 70-year-old, the one with diabetes is a whole lot more likely to get pneumonia than the other one, which is why we want our seniors to not just have Fluvac, but Pneumovac as well. And smart bioterrorists know these things. So if they really want to cause a whole lot of trouble, they will go after our elderly. One of the, some of the things that we want to do in this talk is at least make us aware of what happens with our seniors, that there, we know there's this diverse population of seniors out there, but they're all at increased risk during periods of stress from public health emergencies, whether they're terrorist begun or not. We also want to be able to recognize signs and symptoms in the elderly who are exposed to biological agents or chemical agents and emerging infectious diseases such as anthrax or new viruses and other public health emergencies. And we want to be able to know what we need to do to participate and be part of the mobilized regional and national emergency responses. Here at the Health Science Center, we have the Texas Rangers, the medical rangers, where people have volunteered from all over 
the Health Science Center to serve as rangers in any kind of emergency. And these folks get training and meet periodically. So that's, at the very least, a lot of the faculty are doing that. We also want to be able to uh, recognize psychosocial and ethical issues in bioterrorism response as it would affect old people. And that's important. We, I gave you an indication of that in the emergency room with triage issues. There will be, I'm sure, a lot of these that would, would arise. Also, wherever there is a facility where they might bring seniors and others for care, has to be ready. What would happen? And, you know, uh, was it Baltimore that they did the big trial run for a, for a, I don't remember if it was an atomic bomb or a biochemical attack of some kind, and they had it on the news, and they, they literally took that city and they did, they made a plan, and then they decided to test it and see how long it took to triage people, get them care, and so forth, and so there were actors all over the place being, being uh, stricken by this agent. It was another eye-opener of how far we have to go. And of course, we need to be able to communicate up the line in the event of an emergency. Threats to older people, emerging infectious disease, and other public health emergencies are all in need of being on our radar screen, so we're aware of them. And what the clinical implications are as the physiology of aging, you'll have a talk on this, I believe it's a little later today, in fact, Bob Parker um, from Family and Community Medicine is going to be giving that talk after lunch. And it'll give you an, think about this talk as you're listening to him and what it means. And of course, diagnosing and treating older adults who respond differently to the treatment and identifying mental health, ethnographic, and ethical issues that are going to arise for each and every individual. Developing an emergency management plan for wherever you work. And this includes dental offices. There's actually a big uh, ADA online course now, if I'm not mistaken, on, on the dental office role in a bioterrorist emergency. So for our hygiene folks here today, that's something to think about. Identifying communication links and additional information resources will also be important. So let's look at a few brief definitions. Bioterrorism is the intentional use of biological agents to infect, seriously injure, or kill unsuspecting individuals and cause social disruption and panic which it certainly did with the anthrax scare. The people were out there saran wrapping their houses. Remember that? Duct taping and saran wrapping their houses. Weaponized, the process of making a naturally occurring biological agent into an easily spread substance. So you put it in an aerosol can so you can spray it. Emergency preparedness. Plans that can be implemented in the event of a natural or man-made disaster. An isolation, restriction of movement, or separation of sick, infected persons with contagious disease. Usually in a hospital setting, but can also be at home or in a dedicated isolation facility. That's a whole nother ethical issue with the elderly, again. Quarantine, restriction of movement or separation of well persons presumed exposed to a contagious disease, usually at home, but again, can be in a dedicated quarantine facility and individuals or at the community or population level. So you can have to quarantine 100,000 people. Triage. The French word means to sort, and we use it to determine which patients get treated first based on the severity of their condition. Weapons of mass destruction, or be nice, biological weapons, nuclear or radionuclides, incendiary devices, chemical components, 
or explosions. This little bottle of, uh, this little container of cesium, that's a dangerous and ubiquitous element. Cesium has more radionuclides than any other element. It's found in medical and industrial devices all around us and was the cause of the largest radiation scare in the Western Hemisphere in the late 1980s in Brazil. A little tube of it got out. Somebody took it out of some equipment. The tube spilled and it killed like 100,000 people. Very lethal. Exposure via inhalation, ingestion, and skin contact is a key concept of bioterrorism. The major risk is the retention of inhaled particles, whether it's a chemical that you inhale into your lungs, whether it's a, a, an airborne pathogen of some sort. Toxins may cause direct pulmonary or systemic toxicity. If you think back just to uh, bless you, the firemen at 9-11, one more time, you're on your own. <laughs> and, um, and all of the smoke and the inhalation of all of that into their lungs and how their lungs burned, those were all toxic fumes. That's why they tell you in, in a fire, if you have to get out and there's a lot of smoke, crawl on the floor as fast as you can because all of the toxins rise. Signs and symptoms not apparent for several days after an attack. And sometimes it's hard to pinpoint so that the epidemiologists trying to figure out when and how and where can often have quite a challenge. And mass casualty patterns are really our first clue to bioterrorism. It's not just the one incident, it's a whole bunch. Of course, if we had one incident of smallpox in the United States, that would be enough. The flu alone was the deadliest plague in history. America's deaths from flu were greater than the number of United States servicemen killed in any war. Fluvac. Fluvac does not prevent your getting the flu. If you're an old person, it prevents you from dying from it. And the rest of folks, it helps them from getting a really, really bad case and helps them get over it quicker. There was a Spanish flu and millions of people were affected by that. And of course, the avian flu is this thing floating around now that everyone's all worried about. Over 90% of influenza deaths occur in older persons. Chronic illness associated with a 40 to 150 fold increase in flu-caused pneumonia in the elderly. Think about that. Those folks with diabetes, any other chronic illness, they're much more susceptible. And vaccine does prevent in younger people 30 to 40 percent of infection, not in old people. It does reduce hospitalization by 50 to 60 percent and mortality by 80 percent. They're still incubating the um, flu vac in eggs, I understand. Um, and until they get away from that, people who are allergic to eggs can't take it. Vaccination does not cause flu. People who have gotten the flu have gotten it for another reason. Okay, SARS, we'll talk about SARS briefly. Remember when SARS came out, you saw all those pictures of the Chinese folks walking around in masks? Okay. Three to 10 incubation period, that's all, just three to 10 days, that's not very much. Four to 20% mortality, that's pretty high. No response to antibiotics, that's pretty scary. And if you're over 40, it's gonna be more severe and you're more likely to die from it. And if you have other health conditions, even more so, and of course, if you're a healthcare worker, you're at high risk because you're going to be exposed. And this is how it went. It started at Guangdong Province, China, went to Hotel M in Hong Kong, traveled to 
95 healthcare workers, more than 100 close contacts, went to Vietnam to 37 healthcare workers through 21 close contacts, went to Singapore, 34 healthcare workers with 37 close contacts, United States, one healthcare worker, Ireland, there weren't any healthcare workers, but they got it. And Canada, 11 close contacts, 18 healthcare workers were infected. So it gives you an idea of how these things travel as people move. We're not a stationary society anymore. In the early 90s, there was a large, sophisticated bioweapons facility that housed smallpox, Ebola, Marburg virus, and they had a 4,000 person workforce, 30 building facility, ample biosafety, level four lab facilities secured with electric fences and an elite guard. By 1997, it was half empty, protected by a handful of unpaid guards and no one could say where the scientists went. This was in Russia. Biologic agents. High priority agents pose a risk to national security because why? They can be easily disseminated or transmitted from person to person. They result in high mortality rates and have the potential for major public health impact. They might cause public panic and social disruption and require special action for public health preparedness for which we are not yet ready. And there's the worst list on the right in red. Anthrax, smallpox, plague, tularemia, botulism, and viral hemorrhagic fevers, otherwise known as VHFs. And I'm going to go ahead and stop here because our next speaker is here and it will give you a chance to ask a minute or so worth of questions if you have any. This is just to give you a, a heads up um, as to the kinds of things that we have to begin to address both at home and at work as we try to protect our aged and everyone else at the same time from any possible bioterrorism threats. Anybody have any questions? Smoking caterpillar.